Darwin's theory of evolution is fascinating. But there was one question that even Darwin himself found particularly puzzling. What is the origin of language? In his book, The Descent of Man, Darwin writes, language is one of the chief distinctions between man and lower mammals. But its origins are far more mysterious. How did we develop language? Is this something that's in our genes? I mean, if you think about it, babies do it effortlessly. By four months of age, a baby can already tell you the difference between vowels and random noise. We also know that language is universal. We can find it even in the most isolated places in the world. So it makes you question, is it something that we're wired to do? The same way that we're wired to walk or to blink? Is it something that's in our genes? If it is in our genes, can we find what those genes are? My name is Gabriel Blanco. I'm a neuroscientist. And this is a question that really interests me. How did language evolve? How did humans go and make that jump to have language? Well, when I first started, I thought the obvious place to look was primates. We share 98% of our DNA with chimps, which means that somewhere in that 2% should lie the answer. But if only science was that easy. <laughs> that 2% represents millions and millions of combinations. So I had to change the strategy. And that's exactly what Dr. Fisher and his team did back in the late 90s. They realized that for us to figure out how something works, you have to look at examples and instances where it doesn't work. So at the time, they started to work with a family that had a particular genetic condition. In this family, almost every single member had some type of language impairment that went back generations. So what they did is decided to sequence that DNA and see if they could isolate the genes that were causing some of these problems. And then in April of 2001, they hit a major breakthrough. They found that a small mutation in a gene called FOXP2 was responsible for causing some of these language impairments in family members. A major scientific breakthrough. They had found the holy grail of evolutionary linguistics, the language gene, or as journalists called it, mankind's miracle mutation. Sounds cool, doesn't it? But remember how I told you science is never that easy? I'm going to ask you to put your scientist hat on and be skeptical. Because it just sounds too good to be true. So when scientists took a closer look, they realized that there were some issues. First of all, FOXP2 is found everywhere in the body. We have it in our legs, in our lungs, in our heart. So how it relates to language? Now oh, it's a little bit complicated. Second, we know that it's found across all species. Mice have it, as do dogs, and elephants, giraffes, even our ancestors. A paper published in 2008 in Nature showed that Neanderthals had the exact same copy of FOXP2 that we do today, meaning that there was no evidence to suggest that there was some type of positive, uh, some kind of positive selection. A kind of reminder that in science, for something to be true, you have to be sure. You have to cross all your T's, dot all your I's, and make sure that it's perfect. So if FOXP2 is not the answer, where do we go next? I started at the beginning by saying that language is one of the chief distinctions of humans. But we also know that communication systems are found across all the animal kingdom. I mean, Elephants have certain calls, as do dolphins, dogs. There's even that weird like dozen or so people who genuinely believe their dogs can speak English, which again, who am I to judge? <laughs> Frankly, I actually like that because it really makes you think and reflect. What is really the difference between a dog and what we call human language? What makes our language so special? And the answer to that is that humans have this ability to take a finite number of sounds or vowels and basically combine them into an infinite number of 
sentences and words and phrases. Let me give you an example. Whereas a monkey can tell you when a tiger is coming, it's always limited by its particular context. Humans, on the other hand, we can go beyond. We can express complex ideas. We can tell you the tiger's coming, but we can also tell you about the weather. We can tell you how many stripes it has. Our language has something like a past, a present, and a future. We can tell you how we felt the last time we saw a tiger, how we'll feel in the future. Even better than that, we can talk about hypothetical scenarios of things we've never seen. We could tell you what we would do if we were to see, say, a blue tiger having lunch with Obama and Charles Darwin, because why not? <laughs> Which, by the way, looks kind of something like this. And that ability to have or to communicate these complex thoughts, it's only possible if we use or if we have a complex machinery that allows us to do so. A software or a computer that is so complex and specialized that can process all kinds of information and make it into a way that we can be used to communicate with others. In other words, we need something like this. We need a brain. But then you might ask me, well, Gabriel, dogs also have brains, as do parrots and other animals. So what makes our brain so special? And to answer that, we're going to have to go back to 19th century France. In the night of 1855, a 50-year-old man walked into a hospital in Paris. Let's call him Mr. X. At first glance, Mr. X looked fine. He had no sense of stroke. He could walk. He could smile. <laughs> but the one thing Mr. X couldn't do is he couldn't talk. Unfortunately, Mr. X will go on to die in the next uh, couple of months. But his case wasn't unique. You see, at the time, there was a young neuroscientist by the name of Paul Broca who was carrying out autopsies on patients just like Mr. X. He really wanted to know what was going on in the brains of these patients that was preventing them from being able to talk or to speak. And then he realized that the one thing that Mr. X had in common with all these other patients is that he had a small lesion in an area on the left frontal lobe. He called it the language center. Another scientific breakthrough. Ask any neuroscientist today and they will tell you the same thing. Paul Broca's greatest contribution to science was being able to show that the brain is divided into different sections and that each section has a particular function. He also noticed something else, something weird. All of these patients had damage only to the left side of the brain. Why the left side? I mean, if you've, ever seen, uh, if you've ever seen a human brain, you'll notice that there are two hemispheres that look pretty much identical. So why is that language center only on the left? Why not the right? This is something that scientists and neurologists call brain lateralization, which is a complex term to say using one side more than the other. I'm going to ask you to put your scientist hat on again because I'm going to ask you a question. And I want you to reflect. Think of your dog or the new puppy or kitten that you just bought. <laughs> Are they left-handed, right-handed, left-pawed, ambidextrous? <laughs> reflect. If you're not sure, that's OK. You're not alone. Brain lateralization is very complex. And scientists are still not sure how it works. But what we do know is that it's very much present in humans. And not so much that. Our brains are wired to be lateralized or to be right-handed, something we have in our genes, if you will. Did you notice that pattern there? Genes, only something we find in humans, language. I think now would be a good time to do a little recap and try to see if we can put all of these things together. So what do we know? First, we can agree that language is something unique to humans, or at least our definition of language. Two, FOXP2 was not the answer, but it did teach us that if we want to find genes for language, we have to focus on the brain.
because that's where we find most of the differences. And then three, Mr. X's story was very tragic, but he showed us that humans have a language center, a highly specialized section in our brain only used for language. And that section is almost always on the left side of the brain. So putting all of these premises together, we can create some type of theory that goes like this. Genes lead to brain organization, and brain organization leads to language. I'll say it one more time, because I think it's very important that you remember. There are a set of genes that tell our neurons to go to the left hemisphere, create that brain organization, and then that organization, or that center, is what eventually allows us to speak. But how do we find those genes? This is exactly why last year I decided to come to Montreal and work with children at risk for autism. Why autism, you may ask? First of all, nearly 50% of all autistic children develop some type of language disorder, with a large proportion of those being nonverbal. So autism and language are very close related. Second, whereas 1% of the population is thought to be ambidextrous, that number rises up to 35% in the autistic community. And no one really knows why. We think it might be something related to lateralization, but we don't really know. And lastly, we know quite a bit about the genetics of autism. So as a geneticist, if you want to isolate genes, it's better to work with things that we've done in the past. So I guess now would be a good time to tell you what I actually do every day, which I think is really cool. So in the lab, we bring these cute little babies. We put on an EEG cap. Uh, we collect their brain activity using electroencephalograms. And we have them watch a bunch of videos to see which side of the brain is more activated during which task. Little disclaimer here, we don't actually kidnap babies. We have their parents' permission, and they help us through the entire process. <laughs> and what we found so far, it's remarkable. Remember how I told you that language is found generally in your left hemisphere? Babies as young as six months old already have that type of lateralization and that language center. Babies at risk for autism, on the other hand, they seem to show no dominance between the left or the right hemisphere. What's even more interesting is that babies that have less lateralization go on to develop worst language outcomes. But what about the genes? I set out on a mission with one goal and one goal only, really. I wanted to find the language gene, that miracle mutation. And now it's time for me to tell you that, unfortunately, we haven't found it yet. We've come close, but we're not sure what that language gene is. But I think it's OK. Working with infants at risk for autism has taught me that our jobs as researchers is not only to make scientific discoveries, but to figure out how to use the scientific discoveries to change the world, to create better treatments, to help people. Isolating genes for language and measuring things like lateralization can help us diagnose infants earlier which means we can have more personalized treatments. We can create better outcomes, help them communicate better, give them resources. So no, we haven't answered Darwin's question. We've done quite a bit in the meantime. <laughs> but I think that's OK. I mean, in a way, I think that's, that's kind of the beauty of science, right? We start with a question. And we work through it. And although we don't always find the answer, we usually make different discoveries on the way. Because at the end of the day, all it really takes is just one question, one idea to change the world. Thank you.